Hello everyone, this is Paul Weber from Utah Valley University. I'm going to present to you the work that we have done with building and incorporating virtual reality simulations or games into our introductory nanotechnology course. The designs of these simulations are the result of a collaboration between faculty and students in the physics, engineering, and digital media departments. You will hear one of these students, Sky Slade, narrating a simulation later in this presentation. While there is a fun aspect to these games, they are all created with the purpose of improving the laboratory training for students. Note that they do not replace the labs. Rather, as you will see, we use them as pre-training in preparation for working with the real equipment. The actual hands-on experience in the real laboratory is indispensable for the students. One of the early advocates of engaged learning said, tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. The author of this quote was Ben Franklin, a man clearly ahead of his time. An emphasis on engaged learning is part of the mission statement here at UVU as well as at many other community colleges and universities. Uh, now, before I go on, pursuant to best practices in the middle of our current pandemic, let me help Ben here with something. Excuse me. There, that's better. The simulations presented here were part of our first offering of an introductory course at UVU this past spring, 2020. And fortunately, we were able to complete the laboratories that I'll be discussing today before COVID-19 disrupted our ability to meet on campus. Our university is not generously endowed with modern equipment. And these laboratories have only one copy of the essential instrumentation, electron microscope, photolithography equipment, and RF sputtering unit. So training in advance with our virtual reality simulations allows us to manage having groups of two students only at a time to work through the equipment and to work through it as effectively and efficiently as possible. Another important consideration is to have students feel comfortable with the equipment so that they will avoid making mistakes that can damage the instruments as well as being able to understand the full picture of the laboratory exercise before they do it in real time. The bulk of the work in designing and creating these simulations came from a dedicated group of students in our digital media department. This was an interesting cross-disciplinary collaboration. And for these students, this project satisfied the senior project requirement for their major degree program. The attention to detail in these simulations has been impressive and it involved many visits by the digital media students to the equipment housed in the physics department to check on details and to learn more about procedures. The platform to create these simulations is the standard software program called Unity. One of the immediate questions in design was how to incorporate the long list of instructions and procedures within the simulation, and the team adopted the approach of an in-simulation menu guide, together with a few well-placed labels that identify the items of equipment. 
Equipment control panels expand in size when clicked on so that toggle switches, control knob panels, etc. expand to a usable size in order to be able to work with VR controls. Now, as I mentioned, these simulations indicate a real laboratory procedure, and there is a final graded run, which occurs after as much practice as the students wish to devote. This run identifies each step where an error was made or procedure wasn't correctly followed, as well as reviewing the entire procedure for the students. The VR controls that we are using are the Samsung Odyssey, which render a very lifelike experience after the students become acquainted with the controls and learn the operation of the teleporting feature. The executable modules or builds for these simulations are available at our project website. These can be run by anyone with a similar set of hardware. It is worth noting that the combination of task learning with virtual reality experience seems to be more fun for the students. It was very easy to get students to go to the VR studios and to practice these. So there were three simulations we wanted to test this semester, all four procedures that lasted about two hours in the real laboratory. The first is a combination vacuum system trainer and RF sputtering deposition lab, in which they practice the mechanics of a two-stage pumping system. Our high vacuum pump for this unit is an old-style diffusion pump, but the procedure of valve operation for the four-line is the same as for the more commonly used turbo-molecular pump. It gives the students experience in and an understanding of the correct protocols needed for switching valves in order to avoid serious damage to the high vacuum pump. The end result of this laboratory are thin coatings of chromium and gold on glass slides or silicon wafers. The second simulation was for our electron microscope, which is a test scan Vega 3 model. Students practice preparing the samples for microscopy and then practice the controls of the microscope. This gives them experience in adjusting the three parameters of working distance, magnification, and stigmation in order to achieve the highest resolution images. In the end, students are asked to produce a highly magnified image of the hair and pores on the knee of an ant specimen and to make measurements of spheres on our SEM calibration standard. The level of detail designed into this aspect of the simulation by the digital media students is truly impressive. And it allows students who work with the real SEM to be much more efficient with the actual instrument. The third simulation is a photolithography process simulation. Students learn to work and to program, to work with and to program a spin coder to bake a sample and then learn the operation of a mask aligner to expose a pattern on their samples, followed by the development steps. In these figures, you can see an example of the kind of visual fidelity achieved with Unity in modeling the sputtering apparatus. The students start the simulation by going to an instruction menu, such as the one that you see, uh, the pad that you see in the counter on the right side. 
They actually grab this pad and take it with them during the simulation, setting it down on the counter, or sometimes even dropping it on the floor, in order to free up their hands to use tweezers to adjust controls, etc. Of course, the procedures in VR can be, formed, can be performed faster than the real laboratory, as they circumvent the time needed to pump a system down, to wait to establish the sputtering pressure, and so on. The timed runs in the simulations take 25 minutes or less once they have become familiar with all the steps. An important feature we have built into the simulations is the ability to identify mistakes made during the procedure. The more serious ones lead to correspondingly higher deductions in the overall grade, and all mistakes are reviewed for the student at the end of the run. The students practice these programs in the Department of Digital Media's VR laboratory, where up to four students at a time can be operating different sim simulations simultaneously. Student experts familiar with all the simulations are present to monitor and assist but the quality of the menus and the labels of equipment in the simulations means that most of the time, the students start and simply find their own way around, more or less independently. As an optional feature, various levels of difficulty for the final test run can be selected, all the way up to expert level in which no menu or equipment labels appear. In this case, students rely on their memory of all the steps in the procedure. A nice add-on in some of the simulations, as in this one for the electron microscope, are pedagogical illuminations of the underlying structure of certain pieces of the equipment. In this case, students can at any time toggle on the electron beam column to open up a window showing the basic structure, including the filament and magnets for focusing and beam control. The simulation for the scanning electron microscope gives students practice in producing high quality images by using three control parameters of the instrument in concert. One of the tasks in the SEM simulation is isolating and achieving optimal focus for a small detail on a sample, in this case going up to magnification sufficient to achieve a high resolution image of details on the knee of an ant. I have to give credit to our digital media students for the terrific job they did in creating a virtual copy of not just the image and its magnified copies, but also in correctly simulating the response of all three of the control parameters of working distance in Z, magnification, and stigmation adjustment. At the end of the simulation, a scoreboard appears in which all details of the procedure are reviewed for the student. In this case, the working distance is showing in red, indicating the student could have moved the stage a little closer vertically in order to obtain a better image. The third simulation deals with the important process of photolithography. In this simulation, which I will show a actual copy to you in a minute, the processes of applying photoresist to a wafer, baking the wafer, exposing a pattern on it with ultraviolet light, and then developing the wafer are all modeled. 
Now I'm going to run a video produced and narrated by one of our digital media students, Sky Slade, going through the steps of this simulation. Now, the activity here occurs fairly quickly because she has condensed it into a shorter run to fit into this presentation. The, the intent is to show you some of the detail that can be included in virtual reality. The spin coder and mask aligner in particularly are well modeled and include pop-up menus of the displays they will use to program them in the real laboratory. So I'm going to run this simulation for you now. For the photolithography simulation, the first step is to prep the room by turning off the lights and turning on the nitrogen tank. The first step with the wafer is to apply the photoresist on the wafer within the spin coder. Then to set up the spin coder, I close the lid and turn the vacuum on. I set the sequence to run for 30 seconds at 500 RPMs for the first step. And then step 2, I set it to run for 40 seconds at 2000 RPM and start the process. During this process, looking in the machine, we can watch the photoresist spread across the wafer as it should. Next, I remove the wafer from the coder and put it on the hot plate at 100 degrees Celsius to pre-bake for about 10 seconds. After the pre-bake, to align the mask onto the wafer, I place the wafer onto the mask aligner and then place the grid I want onto the machine and turn the machine on and run a cycle for 4.5 seconds.
final step to finish the photolithography process is to put the wafer into developer. So I fill one petri dish with the developer and one with the distilled water. The wafer should be left in the developer for a full 5 seconds, but I did not leave it in for the full time, and this mistake will be reflected on my score. I then rinse off the extra developer in the distilled water, and I place the wafer onto the side. After I finish the process, I then clean up the room by rinsing out the petri dishes, turning off the nitrogen tank, and turning on the lights. My final score shows that I only left the wafer in the developer for 2 seconds rather than 5, which brought my score down from an A to a B. Now, now this simulation is abridged in order to run in a shorter time than the actual 24 minutes that elapsed. And yes, a couple of steps here need to be adjusted, such as not putting the tablet onto the hot plate and not flushing unused photoresist down the drain. But it shows the basic capability of what can be achieved in these simulations. All of the simulations can be completed within 25 minutes once the students have practiced the steps of the procedure. At this point, I want to give my special thanks to the folks at Erie Community College for allowing our students to complete the real laboratory part of this particular simulation through a virtual Zoom lab at their facility, as our laboratory here had just shut down at that time due to COVID-19. As I mentioned earlier, students enjoy running these simulations. I have seen instances of friendly competition in some of them to see who can achieve a higher score or to finish faster. Following up each simulation by doing the real laboratory is a very effective training method. It is important to note that an instructor is always present when the students do the real lab. Student comments show that what they got out of the VR simulations is exactly what we had hoped that they would, which is to say breaking down barriers of hesitancy by using equipment they hadn't seen before in the virtual reality which prepared them for when they did the real laboratory. This comfort factor, um, which is to say that you will be encountering the real version of something you are already familiar with, is sometimes referred to in VR literature as developing a sense of belonging. It can help overcome hesitation students may have when doing the real lab. Developing situational awareness and deepening of curiosity about the processes also happens. Students seem much more free to ask questions, and in particular, questions of a deeper nature than if they were encountering the equipment for the first time. As a physics teacher, of course, I always enjoy it, I always consider it a success when deep questions probing the how and the why emerge. 
And even though we don't have a direct measure of this yet, we believe there is longer retention of the exercise and a better trained technician results from this two-step approach. Only three of the eight laboratories in our course had VR simulations associated with them. The other labs consisted of simpler exercises in fabrication, measurement, or characterization that required no VR components. However, for more elaborate and equipment-intensive exercises, such as the sputtering electron microscope and photolithography laboratories that I've just shown to you, we believe the VR plus real lab approach makes them more effective. One of the many challenges that many of us face it, that is in fact part of the charge of nearly all ATE projects, is forging closer ties with industry. An idea we will be pursuing is presenting to industry examples of what they might be able to do in training within their own facilities. An example here in the Utah Valley area is the Micron facility in Lehigh, Utah, which was formerly known as IM Flash. We have visited this site with students, and of the photos they were allowed to take, digital media students have begun to put together examples of what can be created that may be of direct benefit to their training needs using virtual reality. Hopefully, this will also serve to impress upon industry representatives some of the thoroughness of training we are doing here and thereby make our graduates more interesting to them as employment candidates. In conclusion, I have presented here three of the VR simulations we have already created for training students in the operation of nanotechnology equipment. More simulations are being developed and will ultimately be publicly disseminated on our website. The site also includes contact information for people involved in the project and other resources we are developing as part of this grant. A potential future grant project would be to produce VR simulations for more common and universally available equipment, in addition to the specific instruments at our educational institution. For example, one could have a training module for the DECTAC stylus profilometer or for commonly used AFMs, such as the Cypher by Asylum Oxford Instruments. Finally, I want to mention a future professional development opportunity. One of our gr current grant project components is the offering of a workshop in the design and creation of virtual reality programs that accompany real laboratories. Please watch for announcements on this workshop, which will be happening in May 2021. We do have funding available to subsidize travel and participation costs for this workshop. And truly, May is one of the most beautiful times of the year here in Utah. So thank you very much for your attention. And please feel free to contact any of us for any questions or for more information.